Dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we uh, will be has not yet been known, been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Before we... Um, go any further in this subject, in this topic, this passage today, why don't I pray? Let's pray together. God, thank you that you are here this morning. Thank you that we can know your love and your grace and your mercy. And I pray, God, that you will just be revealing your love and your heart to us today. And I pray, Lord God, that you'll be helping me to communicate that in a way which we can all understand, open our eyes and our hearts, God, so that we may be able to see your grace and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, a few weeks ago, I was reading a, a book, and as I was reading it, I was engrossed in it, and then I got to a page where they were trying to make an illustration, and they had one of those magic eye pictures have you ever seen them? I think we've got an image. Can we have an image up there, Michelle? Magic eye image. And um, I don't, have you, any of you seen these? These kind of really big when I was at school and university. And base, who's, who's seen these magic eye things before? Um, those of you who have are now just trying to squint to see. Basically, for those of you who haven't, you've got to, you look at it and it just looks like a bunch of colours. But actually, as you look at it intently and as you do a whole bunch of things, something appears out. Like a, you know, like a word or a picture or an image or something. And these are really big, you know, 10, 10 years ago. And anyway, I was, really, I was really intently reading this book and I thought, oh, I'm not really good at these, we're going to try and do it. And so I went through the whole process of trying to be able to see what actually was in it. So I'm kind of doing what you're supposed to be kind of in. And then, no, I can't see it out again. No, it's not working. And then, and then I tried cross-eyed. So sometimes what you're supposed to do is you look at it cross-eyed and then you kind of then focus in and do all that. Has it, does anybody know what I'm talking about here? And it's kind of like, and, and, um, and so I'm doing this. That didn't work. So then I tried cross-eyed really close and then bringing it out and then back. And it's, I just could not get it. And around that time, I realized that I was sitting on the tube. And everybody around me was kind of like, what in the world is wrong with that person? He has absolutely got issues. I don't know about you, I, I, can, I can never get these things. Uh, some people are really good at it, I can't. Um, but there's this thing about seeing and looking. We can look at that picture, but not see what is intended. Looking and seeing. And sometimes we are surrounded by noise, the noise of culture, information. We're, you know, There's so much out there that we can't, See, as the phrase goes, the wood from the trees. We can't distinguish. And I think when we look at love, there is so much confusion today about what love is. What is love? Is it feelings? Is it emotions? Is it sex? Is it long-term relationship? Is it um, life? What is it? What is love? And we get so many um, uh, images and messages in our culture today through media. That's a real challenge. For an example, a couple of days ago, we went for a, um, we just went up to, to uh, Shoreditch to kind of check out some bakeries because my wife and my brother-in-law, Aaron, who's the um, site manager here, they love that kind of stuff. So I just went along for the test tasting, kind of, that, uh, uh, just to kind of go with that. Um, but there were images. So the first one, we just we got on the overground. Um, Michelle, if we can get that image up. And there was the dating agency. And, the, and the, the phrase goes, if you can see it there, love struck. Now it's your turn to meet someone amazing. 
And I don't know if you sit on the tube, there's loads of these things, kind of um, dating kind of uh, websites, all promising love. And then we walked into one bakery, and then there was this sign, um, which is the next image, and it was, um, Monty's needs you. Come with a mate, leave with a date. So, so that was that one. Now, now, what I'm saying, I'm not saying that this is bad or wrong or anything like that, but what I'm saying is that there are just so many images around love. How about we go to the next image? This one was brilliant. I don't know if you can see it. You probably can't see it, but there's a guy lying there. Um, can we get the arrow? He's lying there in a wheelbarrow asleep. That has absolutely nothing to do with the talk, but I just thought it was really funny. <laughs> We're walking along the street, and there was this guy just fully, just, you know, fully asleep in a wheelbarrow, and I just thought that was really funny. Maybe it's just me, that's for my own humour. Sorry about that. But there is, there is so much um, confusion, I think, or so many messages that it's really hard to understand, and that is a cultural thing. It's also a personal thing, because we all have our own conceptions, preconceptions of, of what love is. Disappointment, hurt, Memories, cynicism, loss, they all inform our understanding of what love is. And this morning I want to ask the question to you, what stops you from receiving? What stops you from seeing? What stops you from giving love? What stops you? What are the things that, that, that inform you? Maybe you're not even aware of them and, and maybe today God is wanting to, to open your eyes. My prayer is that that is the case today, that he will be opening your eyes so that you can see love. And so I've kind of titled today's talk this simply, seeing God's love changes everything. Seeing God's love changes everything. And John here, first word, in verse one, if you open your Bibles, keep your Bibles open, says this, see. See. It's easy to miss that word, see. Because I think that John is saying it's because love is not easily seen. Love is not always easily seen. He says it twice. He says it in verse one and then he says again, but we shall be like him for we shall, in verse three, we shall, sorry, verse two, we shall see him. It's about seeing. God's love is visible. God's love is visible. And firstly, God wants us to see his love. So verse one, let me read it to you. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Firstly, he wants us to see that God loves us. He wants us to see that God has lavished his love upon us. He has poured his love upon us unto us. We know we see because we are children of God and we'll come to that later on. We, he wants us to see that God loves us. He wants us to see that God loves you. He loves you. God loves you. That's the first thing. See what great love the Father has lavished on you and on me. Secondly, he wants us to see, and it's a future thing here, Christ. In fact, it's a promise, it's a hope, and we'll come to this later on, that we will see Christ. We can see Christ. We can see something of Christ, but there is so much more to see, and that is the hope that we look forward to. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let me point you to 1 John 3.16. If you just um, turn over the page. You want to know what love is. You want to see love in Christ. 
then verse 16 says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. How can we be called children of God? How is it possible that God can love us in this way? How is it possible that we can be called children of God? It's because Jesus, God's son, God in human flesh came and died for us. And maybe you've never heard this before. Maybe the whole idea, the concept that God loves you, that God loves you is a completely foreign concept. How can, how can this other being, this, you know, thing, person, whatever your concept of God is, love me, even know me. Yet John says here in verse 16, we can know love because Jesus laid down his life for us. And we're going to next week explore that a little bit more. So I encourage you to come back next week. But the reality is I want to say for you today is that we can know love. It is possible to know love, God's love through seeing Jesus. Because Jesus came down, God incarnate, and died for us, took on all our brokenness, all our shame, all those things that we fear, all the things that we are embarrassed and shamed about. He has taken all that upon himself and says, and said, I will take that, I will die for you so that you can know love, that you can know me, that you can know me. God. And, Jane, uh, and John is saying to us, see, can you see it? Don't just look, can you see? Do you know? Can you see the love? Can you see that God loves you? Paul tells us then uh, in Romans, Paul was um, another apostle who wrote many books in the New Testament. He says this, for those in, in Romans chapter eight, verses 14 to 16, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You see, the Holy Spirit then tells us, we know there's this sense of knowing that we are children of God, that we are loved, that we are carried, that we are safe, that we can know God's love. You know what, last week we were in the evening service, we were worshiping at the end of the service. Um, and as we were worshiping, there was this really strong sense that God just wanted to pour out his love into us. And that's what the Spirit does. The Spirit is amongst us here. That's God in His Spirit working amongst us, informing us and letting us know that we are loved. That's what Paul was telling us. And as we worshipped, there was, God was doing stuff and, and, and people were um, uh, worshipping and just knowing God's love. And there was somebody at the back. And as they worshipped, they had this profound sense of God's love for the first time. Never before had they received God's love. Never had they said, you know, I acknowledge that God loves me, that Jesus has come and died for me. And in that moment, as we sang, the Spirit came and just poured love into this person's life. And that person became a Christian. Said, this is real. I know it. I, he was glowing. It's real. I know God's love. That's what the Spirit does. Maybe, maybe you're struggling to see this morning God's love for you. Maybe you are feeling like you are unlovable. You may have become a Christian. You may go, yeah, I, I can say that God loves me. I know the story of Jesus. I know the whole, the whole deal. I know it. I can look at it, it informs me, but can you see it? Can you see it? Do you know it? Is it in here? Does it inform your everyday life? When you go to work, when you wake up, you know that you are loved. That no matter what your story is and, and what your history is and what you've done, you are loved. Can you see it? And maybe you've never come to that place of going, wow. God loves me. I want that. 
Maybe today is the day for you to say, I receive God's love. So John is telling us, firstly, see God's love. Can you see it? Secondly, we see that God's love is both, it's seeable, we can see it. Secondly, it's lavish. It's sumptuously rich and elaborate. It's generous. It's extravagant. It's literally, if you take the, it was, the word which used is out of this country. Or as I always say, it's out of this world. God's love is out of this world. Literally, out of this world. It's out of this world. It is lavish. I love that word, lavish. Just everybody say with me, lavish. It's just a nice word to say, lavish. God's word, uh, God's love is lavish. Now, I don't know if you've ever received a, a gift before that is lavish. Has anyone ever, you've ever been taken to a, a, a restaurant or a, a, um, a hotel which has, is lavish? Have you ever received a lavish gift? I remember when we were a kid, my, um, my dad, um, we had, uh, we were, I was in a big family, I'm the oldest of seven kids, and um, we had one van that was properly, you know, kind of to spec so that it could take all the kids, and then we had a second car, and, and, and it wasn't a really good car, and Dad was driving to a meeting one day, and he, um, he was, he was he, it was just this old rubbish car, and when he got to this meeting, um, this person who happened to be own various car dealerships said to Dad, he said, Graham been praying and I feel like God just wants me to give you the keys to my sports car (laughs) and I was so excited to when dad came and picked us up from school that afternoon he rocked up because we basically when we we came to school everyone knew when the circums arrived because it was his banged up van that used to backfire every 10 seconds it was so embarrassing and then for dad to rock up in this lavish amazing V6 sports car, I was like, amazing, wow, what a lavish gift. I don't know if you've ever received a lavish, undeserved, bountiful, abundant gift. Maybe the picture that we can look at in, from Jesus is the one of the prodigal son. So Jesus gives this picture of, of these two sons. Don't know if you know the story. There's two sons. One's the youngest son, he's the rebellious son. Younger sons always are the rebellious ones, I find. The oldest ones are the, no, no, no. I'm teasing, I'm teasing, don't worry. Oh, wait, wait, I'm gonna bash the oldest son in a minute. So the younger, young, the younger son says, right, dad, give me my inheritance now. I wish you were dead. I wanna go off and party. He does. After spending all his money, he realizes that he's just been an absolute idiot. His, his, his life is wasted. It's a mess. And he says, well, maybe I can go back to the father, go back to the house and just be a servant because then I, at least I can eat food. So he makes the long journey back to the father, afraid of what, what, how the father will respond. But there the father is looking, searching, waiting for this younger rebellious son. And what does he do? Does he go... I'm going to forgive you, but first. No, he runs out, runs out to meet this shamed, disappointing son and wraps this cloak around him and gives him this royal ring and says, come on in, let's have a party. Let's let's just celebrate that you were gone and now you're here. The father lavishes his love on his younger son. No matter what he has done, no matter how broken he has been, no matter the, you know, what his story is. The interesting thing is as the, the oldest son who has been serving his father faithfully all these years, I'm always struck with this story about how the, 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 the love that is lavished on both sons in different ways, is, the response is different. The father runs out to the older son who's pouting. He says, I don't know why I can hear there's parting going on because my son who was, you know, my brother who was a rebel is now, now being received in. The father goes out to the older son and says, come on to the party. He doesn't. He doesn't see. The older son doesn't see the father's love. He doesn't understand the lavish 
grace that the Father is willing to pour out. Again, I come back to it. Can you see it? Can you see God's lavish love for you? Thirdly, God's love is permanent. We see here, and that's why I read the first uh, verses 28 and 29, because we see that John is communicating that we are born of God. We are children of God. In um, John's gospel, which is a bit earlier on, um, John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, John says this, Yet to all who did receive him, who did receive God, receive his love, to those who believed in his name, he gave, gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. Now, I know that sounds really weird, and you may be thinking, you know, I mean, this is where the term born again Christian comes from, if you've heard of that, born again Christians. It's this idea that we are born of God, born again. Not in human terms, not, you know, we haven't gone back into the womb, womb obviously, and been born again, but there is something that's happened where we have been made children of God. John says that we have been born through the Spirit. We are children of God. And this is hard to understand. I know it's hard to understand. John knows it's hard to understand because he keeps reiterating it, keeps saying, you need to understand this. It's true. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. We are children of God. I want to let you know we are children of God. That is what we are. We are children of God. And I just, I want to let you know, just in case you don't, that you can't undo birth. You can't do it. You can't undo birth. It's permanent. Paul, um, who I referred to earlier, talks about adoption as another way of understanding it. We are adopted. Kirsten, who's part of our church and in my connect group, um, works in adoption. And I, I just, I texted her the other day when I was thinking about this and I said, Kirsten, with adoption, what's the, what's the legal deal with adoption once a child's been adopted? Can it be reversed? And she said this, no, it's the only law that is irrevocable. Once made, it can't go back. It's the legal equivalent of a blood relationship. Once a child, always a child. God's love is permanent. It's permanent. And you may be sitting here going, yeah, I, 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 I did once receive God's love. I did once say, yeah, I, I want to be a Christian. I want to follow Jesus. But Andrew, you should see me now. You know, there are things in my life which I, I, I have totally messed up. I, I don't think that I am worthy of God's love. I don't, I don't you, God could never forgive me. God's love is permanent. It's permanent. And God is out looking for you and he wants to lavish his love on you. Can you see it? And maybe today you need to receive afresh an outpouring of God's love into your life. Finally, God's love is life-changing. If we're a child of God, our status changes. Our status changes. We have a new father. We have a new family. We are brothers and sisters. Just turn to your left and to your right and just, just check out your family, your brothers and sisters. I'm sorry about it if you're not happy, but you can't choose your family. <laughs> what a great bunch of people. Our status has changed. And with that, we become distinct. In fact, we become confusing to the world. John says this here. But um, where it says, dear friends, um, now we are children of God and what we will has not yet been made known. 
Sorry. Verse 1. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. There is something confusing about that the world looks on and goes, this is confusing. We are distinct. We are different. Our status has changed. Not only does our status change, but our behavior changes. We become like him. We become like our parent. And I, I know I mentioned this a few months ago, but for anybody who's a parent, you see this. Is that children just, they grow up imitating you, which is not great. <laughs> We've got a two and a half year old and it's distressing. <laughs> but we are changed more and more into his likeness. We are changed. And, and it's like we don't even mean it to change. Our outlook changes. Our life changes. Our desires change. We find joy and meaning and peace and purpose in a whole new way. Why? Because love changes us. Knowing we are carried, knowing that we're loved, changes us. And we see this finally in verse 3. All who have this hope, the hope that one day we will see Christ in all his fullness. John is saying one day we will know love in all its completeness. Where sometimes we don't understand, we don't see love. We will know love in all its completeness. There is a hope there. Hope purifies. The hope of knowing the Love in all its purity. Why? Because we see that God is love. We'll find that out later on in this series. God is love. John says it time and time again. God is love. And we will see that in all its fullness when he returns, when he comes again, as John says. But in this place and in this time, we, it is hope that purifies us. It is hope that changes us. Let me give you just a, a quick example. I, when I was dating Megan, I changed. I don't know uh, anybody else who's been in a dating relationship. If you, know, if, if you really like somebody, then you change. You dress differently. You behave differently. You talk differently. You brush your teeth. <laughs> you do your hair. Guys, just out there, that's a tip. If you want to brush your teeth, that's a good one. Um, you change. Why? Because there is the hope. I had the hope that one day Megan would marry me. And so I, you know, maybe it was, you know, false pretenses. Maybe, you know, I was, she was seeing not the right me. I don't know. You'd have to ask her. Um, I'd like to say that she has changed me definitely for the better. Um, but there is this, this is expectation, this building towards it. One day I'll get married to this girl. And so... In that hope, I change. And in, I know it's not a perfect analogy, but in, in, in a similar way, there is a sense of we look forward to meeting Jesus face to face and knowing his love and his grace in all its fullness. But in the meantime, we want to prepare ourselves. We want to change. We want to prepare ourselves. You see, God's love changes us. It gives us hope. It gives us security. It gives us life. And it's an unearned, it's an unearned love, it's an unearned favor, it is grace. God has lavished his love upon us, not because of what we do, but because we come to him. The gap is faith. The gap is faith. And today the invitation for you is, are you willing to make that step of faith? Maybe for the first time, maybe for the second, third, fourth, tenth, twentieth time saying, God, I want to receive and know and see your love again. Maybe the Spirit today, the Spirit, I, I think God is wanting to pour out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit afresh. And maybe there's some of you who, as, I, as we go back to the start, and there's lots of confusion around love, and, and you're, there's lots of baggage and brokenness. Maybe when you think of God, you think of Father, you think of love, that just completely messes it up from there. Your relationship with your father, with your parents was so broken that you cannot even conceive God being a God of love. 
And maybe today God is wanting you to see afresh his love for you. You see, because God's love is visible, God's love is lavish, God's love is permanent, and God's love is life-changing. Amen. Why don't we pray?